Pauline, Joe, I was going to say it's nice to have you here, but it's important to have you here. That's the thing, because what we're talking about is, is something that's serious and, and it's a hard thing to talk about. Pauline, I, I wanted to just start with you and get a sense of, of who Will was as a young man. What, what stands out in your mind? He was fun. <laughs> he was a larrikin. He was a boy people loved to be with. Um, definitely, and that was um, all of Will's life. And, yeah, he's just lovable. He was kind, um, wild. Um, <laughs> we, yeah, we were on a farm and Will was the one that you just... N he never shocked you. And, mm. and actually, we lost Will and everyone knows that. But really and truly, I was grateful I didn't lose him another ten times before that mm. because he was always, like, um, one of those people that ran crash... And his eyes would go, oh, my God, I didn't say that was going to happen. Like, and so <laughs> but, he, but he survived. <laughs> it's a bit he survived up until 24 and, at least. And he's one of those people, from reading about him and listening to you here, that everyone would say, this is someone with his whole life ahead of him. This is someone with everything mm. to live for. Mm. And I think that was the hardest thing. I think um, for parents who lose their children... Um, it, it's like a king hit. It's like as if a stranger was walking along the street and for no reason they hit me between the eyes. And when I come, come to, people around me are saying, but you must know why they hit you. Mm. I actually don't know why to this day. Um, and everyone has a different theory why, why Will may have taken his own life. But I can tell you now, it can be a different thing every day for me. Because there was so much going on in his life, wasn't there? I mean, he was... Um He'd been really a terrific sportsman, um, running his own business. Uh, he was he was successful. I think you even said that to him, didn't you? You, you were successful. Yep, he was, and um, but he he had taken a blow six months earlier. He had gone out into business on his own, and you get the normal pressures of business because he was an electrician. Elect electrician, yes, and then he. Um, in, so that was in the May. In the June, he actually was playing football in Musselbrook, and he was taken out in a tackle and Will found out after that that the doctors were advising that he would never play that sort of sport again. Um, and I think that Will, that started the, um, the, the, the journey into a hopeless state for Will. He was getting behind in invoicing and everything, but it just seemed to be a, a sadness came over him and a confusion. And it was a, a sense that who he was, he was no longer. He was a... He was a local hero, wasn't he? He was a terrific football yeah. player. He loved to be there for his mates. He was one of those people. I, one of his mates actually said to me, he was shocked and he said, if, if, if I ever went to war or if I was in a bad situation, Will was the guy that you would want with you mm. because you knew he would have your back. And as a mother, you cling to all these lovely things. Mm. But it was the one thing I remember that, yeah, Will was that person. He, he was very kind to me as a mother because I have um, two other boys that torment me. <laughs> And um, Will was always like, you know, leave mum alone. I don't say that to mum. Or mum, you look beautiful. And he was he had that gentle nature and I love that about him and I miss that about him. And Joe, just listening to what Pauline's saying there, it could be your story in many respects, couldn't it? Because you were the boy with everything to live for. You were the football star. You were playing with South Sydney, the world at your feet, happy-go-lucky, everyone loves Joe. Yeah, it's, it, it's even tough hearing that, you know, mm -hmm. that story because it's something that you really relate to. Um, that, was, that, was, that was me. Mm -hmm. you know, it, was, it was everything that I was as a person and, and everything that I hid from everyone. You know, I didn't like to talk about anything that I was going through emotionally and I think that's a society thing as well. But, you know, for me it was... I, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely lucky to be, to be sitting here today and, and for me it's... You know, I'm, I'm grateful that, that I get to wake up every day and, and to make impact on communities around this space because, you know, there are so many people out there who are, who are in silence that are suffering that, that, that feel... But you know. how do you explain this? Because you were at the top of the tree. You were playing professional football. Um, to all intents and purposes, you're, you're a successful person. But you said something a minute ago there. You were all of that, but you were hiding. What were you hiding? You know, for me, it was I was the best Joker player out there. You know, I uh, uh, I could put the face on the front for everyone, uh, but the minute I walked and looked at myself dead in the mirror, I hated that person. 
I hated everything. Why? It was because I, and 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 for me, it was it was an inner dialogue that that I've had for a very very long time, long before I was a I was a rugby league player and long before I was a boxer. For me, ever since the age of about 13, 14, I, I'd had a, an inner dialogue that that spoke to me, that told me that I wasn't good enough and that I don't deserve to be here. Second guessed and questioned every decision I made as a person on the footy field, in general, in conversation. It told me that I wasn't good enough and that I didn't belong here anymore. Looking back at my career and what I've done with both rugby league and boxing, I'm extremely proud of what I've done now is because I knew that in those tough times I had to fight tooth and nail for that. And, you know, post rugby league career and, and you know, I covered a lot of what I was doing with with alcoholism and drug addictions, and and for me it was that was the band aid of what was was underneath it was a was a massive pain and a massive. So you trauma. you were putting on this face, weren't you? You were putting on a front for was, other people. I was the life of the party, Stan. Mm. And I was I was the guy that everyone wanted to be around. I was mm. the guy that you know that that w was the happy go lucky sort of guy for me. And when I was mixing with substance, you know that just inflamed everything. And and you know I, I didn't have a problem with drinking days on, on, on end or taking dr drugs every single week. It, for me, it was, a, it was definitely a binge habit type stuff. But for me, that was the band-aid of what I was really going through. And, and underneath that, once I give all that substance away, lucky enough now, 13 years without a single drop or of alcohol and, and drugs, um, that's when everything come, come to the surface. And it was boxing that taught me how to live through that, to be honest. Pauline, all of that sounds so familiar. I can just see you sitting there and you're nodding and mm. you're agreeing because you know this story, don't mm. you? I, I remember, Will, it, it's funny, everything's really fine in hindsight and, and I think this is the thing, we don't, we're not probably listening or I wasn't aware of mental illness and that's the, probably the problem. But I remember Will second-guessing himself a lot. So we would be out and we, I would hear conversations and the next day William would say, Oh, I hope Stan knew that I meant that and not that. Right. And he would say something like, and I'd go, well, that's how I took it. I might just make sure he knows that I meant that and not that. And he always second-guessed conversations or something he did and what people had perceived by that. And I would say, no, that was just fun. We just laughed. And he went, oh, they probably all think I'm an idiot. And i go, no, it was actually really fun. So it's... For me, that was what that negative dialogue was. Mm. It would jump in there and say... Do they really mean that? Do they really mm. think that? What about their perception of what you're saying? Everything was mm. negative. And for me, that was the most torturous thing and the most, you know, for over a long period of time, in a number of years, um, until I, I learned about what it was. Mm. I, I actually identified what was happening. Um, did I start to heal in that? That Christmas day, um, he said something to you, didn't he? That uh, it was the, the afternoon before. The afternoon before Christmas, mm. yeah. That mm. he said something to you... Um, that may have been a clue, something, a conversation you've spoken about that you go back to and you, mm. you think about a lot. What, yeah. what was that? Um, to start that, I will say that everyone should do mental health first aid. There are sentences that people will use and they're actually reaching out for help and it went straight over my head. But he told me um, he was taking his trailer off his work ute and he just looked up and I see his face and he said, Mum... I've never felt this tired in my life. And I said, oh, farmer mother, <laughs> you'll be right, buddy. You're going on a week's holiday now um, and it'll be fine, don't worry. And he said, Mum, I don't know if I can do it anymore. And I said, Dallin, it'll be fine. We've got a week off. We'll catch up with your invoicing. We'll get everything done. It's going to be fine. You're doing so well. And he was doing really well. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and yeah, we lost him about six hours later. Now, if I know, if knowing what, everything's great in hindsight, but if I know what I know now, I needed to hold my son right then and say, sit down, sweetie, what's going on? But you weren't, that, that's the thing, you, we're not to know. No. These conversations happen every day. People say these things all the time. I know. But Stan, we need to know. We need to become, um, up, we need to upskill our language, we need to upskill our knowledge. And we need to be caring for our families and 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 connecting and not being in a hurry. It was the day before Christmas. I was in a hurry, I can tell you. I need to get home. I love that you said that because um, when I'm out delivering in schools and in communities, the very first slide I talk about with my story and how I've got well is connection. Mm. And, and, it's, and people could say, yeah, well, that, as an Aboriginal man, that, that's connection to culture and it's connection mm. to the country and the land. 
But for me, it's connection to people, mm. you know, connection to ourself and connection to... I'm extremely lucky that the people around me notice when I'm not well before I do because we just put on the front. We think we're putting on the front. Mm. But if we're How many times attention. did you said something like that? I'm Mate, so tired. If we put on, if we put on uh, the, the face enough, our behaviours start to show mm. in what we say and what we do. Mm. In just being that little bit late or delayed or even staring off into the distance mm. doing something. So asking someone if they're OK is more than that. It's more than that conversation. It's paying attention and connecting to people mm. that we have to we have to be so mindful mm. of everything that comes out of people's mouths. Not just we live in a society now where we only care about what comes out of our mouths. Mm. We ask a question with a loaded mm. response. Mm. No, so we've got to connect to people, mm. connect to each other, and have our loved ones connect to us. Yeah, we, we say, Are you okay? Mm. But we might not be ready for what people Say, so, in response, we may not be ready for the answer. And I, and I do love that the work we're doing in the Upper Hunter um, with Professor Lee Waters, who is um, in training our teachers, well, all staff from schools, from the 21 schools over two years, the actual um, whole basis and mantra is see, hear, feel, mm. real connection. So stop racing and racing out. Stop, take a breath, feel what, why did Stan just do that? Mm. Is he trying to tell me something? Start watching someone else's body language. Start to feel the mood of a room. Um, it's and not this feel. No. It's not touching feel. No. It's feel the emotion and the yes. energy that this person's yeah. putting. So this is the basis of um, the training for the school teachers over the two years with Professor Lee Waters. And, and I love that. It, and, and she talks so much about connection. And... I love Lee Waters, um, probably like yourself. Lee has been, I call it a continuum, so zero is where we're pretty neutral. Um, above zero is um, thriving and doing well in life. Anything below zero is mm. where we seem to get all our treatment. Um, Lee has been on both sides of the continuum. Can, can I just take a step back? Because, you know, you're talking about what you're doing here now, and this has grown out of where there's a will, which mm -hmm. is the program that you've been involved in since your son's death. Um, what, what led to this point? This, this point you're talking about now with the people that you're working with in the schools, explain that process for us. OK, so Will had passed away and I couldn't deal with it. I mean, I was a good mum. That doesn't happen to me. That doesn't happen to my family. Um, we had gone through a process of... Um, Everything, you know, from the Grim Reaper when they rolled that bowling ball down and me sitting with my children down and giving them condoms and them going, Mum, <laughs> you know. And I was that mother who went, oh, OK, if they're at danger. So I, I, I wasn't dealing with it. And so I started to Google and look for different things. And the first thing I found, which shocked me, and this all, I think this all happened within one week and it was like a moment, um, the World Health Organisation predicts that if nothing is done, depression and anxiety will be the leading health burden to mankind globally by 2030. Now, when I started to first say that, that was 14 years. We are now down to 12, so the clock's ticking away. The other thing, within a week, I remember the last time I spoke to Will, when we were talking, he was taking his trailer off. He had on a sun hat and sunscreen and zinc cream. And the zinc cream was messy and he so he's, rubbed he's it So he's taking in. care of himself. He's thinking about his health, even though he's, he's dealing with this anxiety, this depression, and potentially, and, and as you later found out tragically, thinking of, of suicide. Yeah, and I have to tell you, then I started to go for an instant, oh, my God, he didn't kill himself. There's foul play here. So I go to see the psychologist and I said, and he went, no, Pauline, you, we, as, we taught him that. And so he just knew to do that thing. And then I said to the psychologist, can we teach mental health? Could I have done something? Could I have given him the tools? And he said, yes. And that was a moment for me. Why aren't we... And secondly, I have six grandchildren that when 2030 hits, if this, and I, and actually I think we're starting to see the very edge of it, um, particularly in r um, rural, um, we're losing lots of good people and it seems to be happening on a much and regular basis. And it's getting bit. younger. Yeah. I, we, I see the onset of these, of what we so call mental health, mental mm. illness, is, is now in the teens, Joe, when it used to be in, in the mid-20s. Mm. 
It's dangerous, and I think, um, without doubt, I think social media has played a part in that with um, expectations and, um, you know, the bullying side of things that everything comes out with with social media. Every kid now has got Facebook and Instagram. and Well, status and, matters. You've yeah. got friends, you're putting on a show, you're performing every minute of the day, and that can so easily be shattered. That takes away our identity of who we are because we're always trying to be somebody else. Mm. We're always trying to be something better, something bigger. Um, and that's not connecting to the person of who we are. Mm. Again, you know, um, and, and, and for us in, in, in our communities, in, in the Aboriginal communities, I changed the, the language around mental health and mental illness because I believe for our people it's, it's a genuine disconnect from our spiritual health. Mm. You know, us as Aboriginal people for, you know, 65,000 years at a minimum have been happy, healthy and well. Mm. Um, so, for, so for us it's about we're, we're struggling to walk between the two worlds of modern society mm. now and uh, traditional Aboriginal people. Yeah, and, and I want to come to that, that idea of creating communities, and I think that's what you're looking at where, where you are. But Joe, I was just thinking, listening to Pauline a minute ago, imagine if you knew what you know now before. Imagine if you'd been taught from a young age, as we're taught to slip, slop, slap, to take care of yourself when you go out in the sun, to take care of your mental health, to take care, to be aware of these things. Imagine the difference it would have made. You know, we're heading to a space now where, where it's, it's an everyday conversation, isn't it? Because mm. we're losing mm. so many different people. Mm. Um, you know, now we speak about mental health just the same as we speak about physical health, which is, I think, is a, a huge importance to... I've got young kids as well, and I've got mm. kids who are teenagers, so they're now being put on uh, every, every single day, you know, faced with these challenges of growing up in a modern world. Um, the fact that it was such a stigma around with, with talking about our mental health um, has, have, has without doubt been a burden to a lot of people, but we're now in a position where we can mm. to our kids. If we, it'd be fantastic if we could go back, and I knew about those things then, but it's unfortunate that we can't change the past. Mm. We can now build on a future with mm. better education. And Joe, you, you and I have talked about this, and you know, I should point out that we're not just Aboriginal people, but we're also related. We're, we're cousins, Joe and I, and we've spoken about this. And I remember something that stuck in my mind, that when you contemplated taking your own life, when you were going to kill yourself, it wasn't necessarily that you wanted to die. Explain that distinction for us, because it's really critical. Often people say, why did they kill themselves? They, they did have everything to live for, but that wasn't what you were thinking, was it? Yeah, and, and let's, not, let's not forget or mistake the fact that, that I, did, I did try. It wasn't mm. that I contemplated doing yeah. it. I actually did everything within the power of my two hands to not be here anymore. Mm. Something bigger than me, and, and, and my fate was to not, was to not, not be, um, you know, in, in the, the result that I wanted at the time, but thankfully... But it wasn't it, that you wanted to die. It wasn't was it? that I wanted to die in those, those moments. Mm. It was that I, I couldn't see an end in sight. Mm. And I thought that if I've battled with this for so long, over such a period of time, exactly what your son said, I don't think I can do it anymore. Mm. You know, for me, it wasn't about wanting to die. I had, I had kids. I, I, I'd lived a, you know, a great life as a professional athlete. It wasn't that I wanted to die. I just wanted the pain to go away. Mm. And I felt and I thought with everything in me in that moment that the only way to end the pain was to end my life mm. because I could not see an end in sight. Mm. You know, and that's why it's so important in the work that we do now is to just talk to people. The tattoo I've got in my, on my wrist is the mm. most important tattoo on my body. T2SP. T2 mm. This too shall pass. Mm. Mm. Every tough situation that I've had, I've confronted, it's come to me, but it's, I've gotten past it. Mm. So every tough situation that I have still to this day, I'm not better now. Mm. We, were just, we were just talking before we came on and we were discussing some of these things and the work that you've done with Where There's a Will and, and making people aware that it is so easy to imagine the worst, Pauline, isn't it? Mm. This catastrophizing is the phrase that yes. psychologists use, that yes. you look at a situation and you immediately go to the worst potential outcome. Mm. And you see this all the time, don't you? Even in the worst... I think I do it all the time. I think it's... it's <laughs> we all, we all it's, do. It's, it's actually negative bias and <laughs> negative bias. And I often say to people when I'm speaking now, and I'll, I'll tell you about negative bias, you're walking in long grass and something moves 
straight oh, it away. Must be a snake. You go snake. I said, and when you look, it's a kitten. I said, so, but that's normal. That's from the time you get out of bed. And they've found out that it starts in the cradle. So children actually start to take on a negative bias. And, and you're working with this now because there are kids. Lee who, Waters is. <laughs> yeah, Lee Waters is. But but you know, through through the work that you're doing and, and yes. the people that, that you've now connected to this program. Even kids at a young age, someone in you know five or six years old may say to the teacher, everybody hates me. Yes. And how do they unpack that? Um, it's like an onion. Um, I know that the, just around that subject of, um, of, of your negative bias, you know, um, everyone hates me. Um, everyone? Mm. Well, the three over there said, and it'll be like, the whole three said it? No, well, Mary said she doesn't like my shoes. And you can actually say, well... Do you think you could probably... Do you like them? Yes. Well, that's a good thing to say to Mary. I like the shoes. Mm. So, But it's more than and that. Positive education is actually a recognition in a school that um, well-being, character and academics are of equal importance. And, and, and you get to focus, don't you, on what are the good things about the child? Yes. And get them to be aware... Yes. Of these, of what yes. are their best attributes? Yes. So from preschool, but it happens right through to year 12. And it actually, if you imagine, it's quite simplistic in early years of preschool um, that they learn there are 24 character strengths that make up our personality and the people that each and every one of us are. And it'd be really great if you got, like, guys went on and did the little um, VS signature strength test. So, but young children can't do that test. So what we do is, um, or, well, the teachers do, they um, get their parents and their teachers and their grandparents to say who, so I'll use my grandson, Fergus. My, um, Fergus is brave, and he, but he's very zestful, but probably love and kindness would be top there too. Mm. Um, so if you imagine, Fergus has already learnt that he's zestful and zestful works really good in the playground and on the farm. But maybe not when you're talking at the back of the class. Yeah. So <laughs> Fergus knows he's zestful, but we celebrate his zest. Yeah. Right? But when he's in the classroom, they may have to remind Fergus that zest is not something that we use in a classroom um, because we have people who, who have love of learning and we're going to try and pull and, on your love and, of and learning. And he doesn't now. have to feel as if the world's against me because they've told me I have to be quiet in class. Yeah. You start to... It, it's a bit of a toolkit, Joe. That's how it seems to me. What do we need in the toolkit to, to be aware of these problems, to be able to identify them and to be able to be, you know, the old saying, forewarned is forearmed. What do we need in the toolkit? You know, the, the best thing about that toolkit is it's strength-based. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we concentrate too much on negatives. Well, we've got to improve our weaknesses. Well, if you're improving your weaknesses, you're also concentrating on your weaknesses. Exactly. You know, let's work on our strengths. Mm -hmm. You know, even me as a sports person, yeah, I had plenty of weaknesses. But you know what? If I build on my strengths, then I'm going to pull my weaknesses with them as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, everything that I speak about uh, in, in communities, again, is around strengths-based stuff. Mm. So the five values that I develop uh, around my workshops that I run in, in schools and the wellness plan that I've lived with. So for me, as a young person, one, I didn't talk about it to anyone. Two, we couldn't afford psychologists, psychiatrists. And if we think there's a stigma about mental health now, think about what it was like 20 years ago, mm. you know. So everything, I've developed uh, key values that I believe a lot of the, the dreaming stories mm. of Aboriginal people are based around learning to live with love for yourself and one another, respect, care, humility, compassion. You know, when you start to live with those five values and everything that I speak about in schools, in workplaces, sports teams, is around those five values. Because if you can le learn to build on those five values, you're going to not only improve yourself, but what you're doing is concentrating on other people with those mm. values, having compassion for people, mm. being humble. Mm. You, you mentioned something before about spirituality. You and I were lucky to grow up in a strong Aboriginal family with strong role models, um, language being spoken, real cultural awareness. That sense of spirituality, not just community, but spirituality and connectedness to that identity, how important is that and how do you try to revive that where it is now missing? For us, as, as First Nation Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people for this country, the first people of this country, we loved, lived and thrived on a very barren country for 
you know, tens of thousands of years. And we did it in harmony with, with, with people, with each other. And, you know, it, it's extremely important that we, that we get back to that because what they were doing was working back then. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in over 500 different languages and countless dialects of those languages, there's no meaning for suicide. Mm. in all of those languages. Mm. Now, if there's no meaning for suicide, that tell, tells you it wasn't around, mm. right, firstly. So if what they were doing back then was working, what we're doing now isn't. And have you found that by ad adopting this in your own life, it's made a difference? I mean, the T-shirt that you have, the enemy within, you have the, 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 the emblem here, of an Aboriginal design. You're connecting these two things. Has that made a difference for you, that reconnection or without, connection to come. Without doubt. For me, once I went back to country and once I went and sat and to learn about the old ways and I sat out with men at ceremony and, and talked about those old ways and learned to live those old ways, an elder said to me, he sat down in the bush, he said, son, if you connect to this stuff, all your mental health problems will go yeah. away. Mm. And another man out there said to me, you're not mentally ill. You're spiritually ill. Mm. You fix your spirit, you'll get better. Mm. And Pauline, I suppose what we're talking about there too is this sense of community. If you look at the Aboriginal community, which is probably a microcosm of this, and the issues that exist in the broader population are exacerbated in the Aboriginal population, the rates of suicide are much higher. The, the rates of, of, of mental illness, depression, anxiety, these things are, are much, much higher. I think that's because of our disconnection. Disconnection. Mm. But the same thing exists, doesn't it? In, particularly in, in, in rural towns where you have a, a hollowing out of community, people moving away, some of the best and brightest being lured to the cities. They would have been the potential leaders of those communities. They're no longer there. How much of a sense of community and the hollowing out of community, the individual focus uh, on society, has contributed, do you think, to the problems that we're seeing? Um, I think it does. Our man, um, one of the things we talk about, it takes a village mm. to raise a child. Well, the neighbour doesn't even know who the child that lives in this house now. So um, a lot of the work we do with Weathers will goes back. And, and why I believe the Slip Slop Slap program worked, um, and I would love the government to have a national awareness campaign for parents to, um, number one, warn them that it can happen in their family, but number two... Um, create an ownership of mental health. At the moment, we're targeting schools and targeting the 25% of people who are ill. This is a national problem of disconnect that we've talked about. It takes a village to raise mm. the child. Slip, slop, slap. Mum could put a child's hat on and she could put on the sunscreen. She had to le they had to leave the house. So she relied on now the school teacher to have the same idea and to say... Will, put your hat on or sit in the shade. Mm. He goes to sport. This coach would say, OK, we'll put our sunscreen on, um, wear our hats, long screen. There was a consistent messaging mm. the whole day. But that consistent messaging became because there was a consistent language, mm. a literature we all understood, and that is what's lacking. Um, it, it's sort of like that... Um, I love Joe's work because I it's strengths based, strengths based, um, gratitude, um, growth mindset. And, and you're all in this together. So the child is not alone. There's a community. There's yes. a school. There's a teacher. There's a neighbour. There's yes. a parent. And that and that that's critical, isn't it, to what what you're saying? Uh, there's so much we could talk about. And um, you know, one of the things that I really wanted to to ask about is the language that we use around this as well. Um, you know, we talk about a suicide crisis or a mental health crisis. Uh, we, even the language we use, sometimes um, we set aside a day or we set aside a month, sometimes gets in the way of actually dealing with this. Mm. Oh, it? it definitely does. If I say crisis, it's almost like something we can fix and then it's done. Yeah. And Joe hit the nail on the head, focusing on the negative. Why do I, and the government's doing it particularly well at the moment, suicide crisis plan, suicide coordinator, suicide um, community plan. Have a guess what? A quarter of the nation is sick. Mm. So what is the real message here that everyone's trying to send us? It's OK to be sick. Just don't kill yourself. You're making us look bad. Mm. That's how I see it. Because how would you like to be someone who's just done well, Joe? That's not an easy journey either, is it? And that, that really... So are we forgetting the other quarter of the people who don't 
actually take their own life? Mm. Do they need to take their life to get the attention they need? And sometimes when you're in that journey of no counsellors, no psychologists, uh, we have some but really limited, nowhere near what we need, what message is it sending them? So it should be a community well being plan. Why do we do well in our community? Why do we do that well? How can we take some of that and put it into um, to well-being and drag them with us? I, I love you. I mean, we're going to get on well. I can see this. We have many we conversations. Look at, we look at um, uh, post post prevention suicide programs, and and they have their merit. I get that. But there's a lot of there's a lot of people who are rolling out these post prevention programs that can't intervene until the suicide happens. Mm -hmm. We should be stopping the suicide before it happens, rather than you, you don't even afterwards. you don't you know you don't use the word suicide often. You, you don't like to use the words mental health even. Do I, you? I, you, I, you I talk about wellness. I talk wellness. about wellness. Yeah. And I think you know you mentioned to me once. Even when we talk about committing suicide, commitment is is associated with with a positive term. When, mm. we're, when we're committing to something, we're committing to something that's positive. You mm. prefer death by, by suicide. People die by depression. Mm. The means of how they die is, is suicide, mm. but they die from depression. E even depression, Pauline, you've, you've talked about a hopelessness. Hopelessness. Depression almost it feels like a, a love. We've become very used to the mm. word. Hopelessness mm. hits with a much greater force, doesn't it? Yes. Well, doctor, that's Dr Martin Seligman's work, and his work is brilliant. Um, and I, mean, I, I actually had the privilege of meeting Dr Martin Seligman last year and there's his work on um, positive education and strengths based is actually scientific um, and there's look it, I don't know how deep we're going to get there's a, a small peanut size um, peanut size thing at the mm. um, base of your brain called the dorsal raphane nucleus and when we go into a state of depression and we've, or trauma it sets it off so it's actually going it's active and it's it's using a lot of your serotonin but they know in positive education and joe learnt this as he went on naturally or whatever meant that if he forced positivity when he woke up what am I grateful for today? I'm grateful to be here. If he always went to a strength-based um, thought, so what happens is when this section of your brain, when you stimulate it with um, determination that you you actually set about to say, well, I'm a little bit down, I'm going to do something. This is, this is, what, the, this, this is what, again, psychologists call this cognitive behavioural therapy, yep. CBT, yep. where you are re-channeling the pathways of your brain. So if yeah. you are someone who catastrophizes, you work through that and you say, yeah. well, what is the worst thing that's going to happen? Or is that did that really happen in your life? Yeah. Um, you know, to be able to change the pathways, Joe. You start to retrain, you start to retrain the, train the pathways in your brain. Mm -hmm. If you automatically think of negative all the time and, you know, we can't... Sometimes I can't control the negative thoughts that goes into my brain. I have thoughts of suicide and plans mm -hmm. of suicide every single day. Those plan those thoughts and plans get they, they get put into my brain, but my action is the most important thing. Mm. What I do next in that critical moment? Do I think of a positive thing? Do I think of gra gratitude? Do I think of compassion? Do I think of these things that then help me to build on a positive rather than mm. uh, you know circulate out of control into a negative? Because you've also spoken about this, Joe, that and this is something that you know we hear associated with these illnesses is that. It's a chemical reaction as well. You mentioned serotonin before, and part of the medication is to inhibit the uptake of serotonin so that you don't have this sort of chemical concoction going crazy in, in your mind. How much of it, when you were going through this, was a, a chemical reaction to these types of pathways, these thoughts? So, for me, I've, I've diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. So, the, again, the chemical indifference between negative and, and, and you know, a, a really depressive mindset and, a, and a, an extremely manic mindset. So, I struggle to regulate between the two. Um, and there's now further research. Uh, the film Concussion mm. talks about head knocks and talks about um, trauma to the brain, whether it's whether or not that's it's mixing with the chemicals through impact. Mm. Um, you know, there, there's there's massive leeway and massive. And, and medication was involved. part of your my recovery, well, without yeah. doubt. Medication was part of my mm. recovery because I could not um, I could not pull my mindsets into a narrow frame like everyone else. Um, now, thankfully, um, you know, medication kept me alive for a long time mm. when I was struggling with psychosis, when I was struggling in these really bad periods. 
But now, thankfully, I'm not medicated. Mm -hmm. Where I learned to regulate my mood patterns, I still have bipolar disorder, I still have manic highs and depressive lows, but when I'm low, I exercise, create mm -hmm. those natural endorphins. Mm -hmm. When I'm high, I meditate to get myself yeah. back down. Pauline, as a family, what's the journey been like that you're on? I, I, you said something lovely before we sat down. You said you only <coughs> wanted to be a mother. Mm. Other people talked about careers and you thought, no, I'm going to be a wife and I'm going to be a mother and that, that mattered to you. But you, you lose your identity when you lose your child, I'm I sure. I had you... three other children, so um, I didn't look, totally lose my identity, but I lost that thing that made me feel a good mum. Mm. I second-guessed me being mum. And it is, it is a hard journey, but, but we did have three other children and, and I mean, as gross as it sounds, um, we couldn't see Will that day because it's um, a police scene. So, and I remember sitting in the car waiting to see him and my children were with me and my husband was with me and I was dead quiet and no one had anything to say. And I remember just thinking, oh my God, how do we survive this? How do we survive something that was whole and beautiful? And I, I imagine it's like losing your right arm or your ability to walk, that you actually have to reinvent what was. And I remember thinking, oh, we've got to flip this. So I think I get that strength base flipping naturally. And I thought, rightio, we have to celebrate how lucky that we were that you were ours. And I, I didn't mention it that day, but then we had a 10 day because um, we, we had to wait for Will's body to come back before we could bury him. But in that 10 days, as a family, I, I kept saying to everyone, at Will's funeral, I wanted a celebration. I don't want to think of the negative of him taking his own life. I want to stand up as a proud mother and a proud father and a proud family and say, he was ours mm -hmm. and we love him. And we still do to this day. And it was wonderful. And I think I do that all the time. I get a bit sad because I miss him. Mm. And it changes the... Losing a child anyway, and I'm not talking just about suicide. I mean, losing a child. Mm. He, 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 the way Will um, died sort of has a few extra problems. But I think losing a child anyway is dreadful. But it, your family unit changes. That that dynamics that he brought to the family is missing, so we change, And but, but that, I suppose... And when we hear about suicide, we know that there are other families going through just what your family has gone through, trying to rebuild a family and a life. Yes, exactly. You know, speaking to that point, Stan, um, it was on, my, it was on my, uh, my book launch for my book, and my, my mother actually sat down with my manager in tears and she said, where did I go wrong? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. What did I do? I mm. thought I was perfect as a mum. Mm. What did I do that has caused this? Mm. Now, now I wrote a blog about it and, and I had that conversation with mum and I said, mum, I could not have been raised any better. Mm. You know, you did everything for me. I was loved, I was fed, I was clothed, I was warm. Everything in my childhood was fantastic. I have a chemical imbalance in my mm. brain. And this is a question that, that people are these. asking themselves. Joe, just to finish on, where are you at? Now, this is a, you know, again, we see these things as if, you know, Joe's been through this, he's come out the other side, but it's an ongoing struggle. It's an ongoing struggle, mate. And, and what, there's, what we know more and more about the research of mental illness, like addictions, is that it's deeply embedded within our genes. You know, for me, I was born with bipolar disorder. I didn't develop it. I was born as an addict. I just needed to put the fuel on the fire for it to come out. Mm. You know, for me, where I am now, I still go through these things and I still put into place the values that keep me well. But how I do that, and it was when, it was back to the point of, of you starting speaking. The very first time I spoke about my story, I noticed that people connected with it. And when they connected with it, they said, Joe, I feel like this too. Mm. And when you're telling me that you can be okay and you there's an end mm. in sight, then I get hope from that. And you know what? The one thing is that we know that hope helps heal people. Mm. And I just started talking about that. And, and the more I talk about people, and, you know, I've, I've spoken to countless people, Stan, whether it's in person, whether it's online, uh, indirectly, directly, it's helping people that keeps me well. Mm. And for a long time, I didn't know that that's what I was doing. But I started to put in concentrate, to concentrate on when I'm not well, I've got to help people. That's what I get to do. And, and now, you know, as an organisation, we're developing an app on people that people that 
can't speak to me can go onto the app and I can talk to it and connect with him spiritually, emotionally, uh, and even you know physically with FaceTime and things like that. And that's what both of you are doing. Um, you're helping people. It's been an absolute honour and a privilege to have you on the program. Um, I thank you so much, both of you for coming in. Paul and Joe, thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Stan.